I was on the OSCON content committee, and I saw this talk, and I'm like, I totally want to see this talk. Um, so I said to him, I don't know if this is going to get into OSCON or not, but I want, will you do it, whether or not it goes into OSCON, will you do it at the Minus Two Group? And he said yes. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Amrit. Uh, I work for this company called Tesoro, which... So the talk which I was supposed to do at OSCON was about databases as a service with Shrove and database virtualization. Um, DBE, by the way, is the product which we built. Um, Shrove is an OpenStack product. We'll talk about both of those. Quick show of hands, how many people know about OpenStack? So I guess we can fly through some of these slides and get to the fun stuff at the end. Um, if anybody wants to tweet, I learned about how to do animation in PowerPoint, so you should all see that I learned something new. So it's Pwn, Tesora Corp, and um, I stole all, most of the images from OpenStack, and thanks a lot, Sherry, for having us here. Okay, uh, what's OpenStack? Open source software building private clouds, like Amazon and Azure, except that it works some of the time. Um, it's also open source, you can run it in a private cloud, and a couple of service providers actually offer it as a service, HP and Rackspace uh, primarily. Um, also, in terms of the general trivia stuff, um, I'm going to be mentioning releases from time to time. Icehouse, Juno, and the K release, which has no name yet. Um, every six months, there's a party somewhere in the world. We just came back from the one in Atlanta. The party in Atlanta was in May. Um, Juno is in October. And uh, the K release, whenever it shows up. OK. Uh, who contributes to OpenStack? So that's us. We just started doing this stuff in February-ish of this year. This is contributions, by the way, to Juno, not to all of OpenStack across the board. Um, all right, as far as Trove, this is the database as a service project, which we'll be talking the most about. Um, that's us. Till last week, we were number one, but somebody managed to sneak ahead of us. Um, but we'll fix that. <coughs> all right, so from a very high level, OpenStack is a simple way in which you can build a private cloud in your own data center. It's a whole bunch of Python code. Um, not so politely, OpenStack is referred to as a big wrapper around libvirt. Um, libvirt, it's basically Linux virtualization library, um, which has a man page of about 20 pages and about 300 command line options. So in order to make it slightly more usable, you wrap it with Python and you get OpenStack. Um, so OpenStack gives you the ability to build a private cloud in your own data center. Uh, we'll talk about some of the projects which are really important. So if you're familiar with Amazon, Nova is the EC2 uh, equivalent. There is nothing equivalent to Neutron in Amazon, but this is the networking service. Um, two storage modules, Swift and Cinder. Swift is the object store, Cinder is the block store. Uh, Keystone is the identity service. Uh, Glance, again, nothing equivalent to it in, in Amazon, but that's where you put the equivalent of, the, of an image. That's where you have all of your AMIs. Um, Horizon is your dashboard. Silometer is a pain in the butt. Um, uh, it's the telemetry service. And uh, Heat is how you do orchestration and Trove, which was just added to Icehouse, is the database as a service project. And there's new stuff supposed to be coming along. Uh, there's a long list of things in that category. So long list of projects, but the ones which we really need to bother about, Nova, Neutron, Cinder and Swift, Glance, maybe to an extent Heat. All right? OK. Everything in OpenStack is about a VM, starting up a VM, and the relationship between the service and the VM. Um, Horizon provides the UI. Neutron provides the network connectivity. Nova is the thing which provisions the VMs. Glance is where you get your images from. Cinder is where your storage is, your block storage. On the other side, Swift is where your object store is, also where your images are stored. And the last thing is Keystone, which is identity management. So think about, if you will, I want to spin up a VM. What happens? Can you spin up a VM, Keystone, 
oh yeah, you can. Nova, I need to provision one, but what am I going to boot it with? Glance, give me an image. Where do I get the image? I get it off Swift. Once I get a VM, I connect it to a Cinder volume. I give it a network from Neutron. And then if all of these things work, you'll be able to connect to that VM. OK. Um, and heat, of course, is the thing which orchestrates all of this stuff. <coughs> Um, last thing, which I forgot, if you ever want to take a backup, which is kind of interesting in the case of databases, backups typically end up going to Swift as well. So Swift is a kind of unlimited volume type of uh, storage. So Swift is a object store, similar to Amazon S3. Yes. Cinder is a block store, file system, mounted, EBS equivalent. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about? terminology, what these projects are. I'll, I'll keep using the same terms. You'll get familiar with them by the end of the day if you're not already familiar with them. Yes, OK? Um, so your simplest uh, non-trivial, not single node dev stack environment is a three node setup. Um, and the way in which you'd set this up, you start with your first machine, let's say your controller machine. And the first thing you typically are going to go and install there is Keystone, identity management. Of course, the first thing you're going to install there is a database, MySQL. Once you got that, install identity management, install Glance on top of it, install Nova on top of it. That's your basic stack. If you want to do anything, you got to have those three. Okay. Go on to your compute node. Install the basic tools which you need in order to run OpenStack, and then run the Nova, the Nova compute side code. If you are going to be running Neutron, you need to have the Neutron code somewhere. Neutron can also run on here. It doesn't have to run on Node by itself. Once you're down with this, you can try to start an instance, which basically means that you're going to talk to this machine and this machine is going to spin up a VM for you on your compute node. And you can have as many compute nodes as you want. Typically, you'll have a controller node and a large number of compute nodes. That's basically the idea. Um, your networking is managed for you under the covers. Three colors here. One is the red management network, the green network, which is shared by the instances, and the blue network, which is where you get to this whole thing from outside. So if you were trying to talk to this infrastructure, you'd be talking over the blue network to something here, which is going to be orchestrating something for you over there. And it's going to be getting IP addresses for the VMs out of this pool here, and back channel traffic running over the red network. So with that is a very, very quick, here's what OpenStack is all about. Um, let's talk about databases in OpenStack. So what is Trove? Trove is the database as a service project in OpenStack. And the basic idea of um, Trove is to be, for OpenStack, something which is a combination of both Amazon RDS and DynamoDB. RDS is only the relational database service. DynamoDB is the uh, NoSQL database. Trove, the idea is it's going to be both. So. This, by the way, is the Horizon interface to an OpenStack cluster. You can look at the databases. There's a database here called my.db, running on a tiny instance, and it's right now built. Somebody tried to create it. It's still not up. Through OpenStack, you can do things like launch the database. You can take a backup of a database. You can get a list of backups of a database. Basically, the idea is it should take away from you all the administrivia in running a database. And this could be MySQL, this could be Mongo, Cassandra, what have you. There's right now a patch to do Postgres and Vertica. And over time, it's going to be many more databases. Treating each of those things as a guest database, this is the goal. And again, I peeled this off the OpenStack website. The idea is to make it easy for you to utilize a database in the cloud. Again, all that OpenStack does is is make it easy for you to do the database. OpenStack itself does not implement a new database. What we were talking about earlier, Tim, we're not going to implement a 
new backup method, whatever the database happens to support, will be used and so on. Um, so that's basically the objective of Trove. So the basic idea is to make it easy for you to use it and high availability and things like that are things which we talk about. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. So at a very high level, um, again, thinking back to the picture from several slides ago with an architecture, somebody has a trope command line interface and says trope create, which basically is make me a new database of some kind. And the rest of the parameters are going to say, oh, there's an image which I want you to use. That image is going to be for a MySQL database and so on. So the trope command, CLI, interacts with trope the controller. And the trope controller is going to go to Nova, provision a VM. That virtual machine is going to be given an image. That image is one which was customized for trope. It's going to spin up this virtual machine on the compute instance. And on that instance, there's a little piece of software which is a guest agent. So effectively, what you're doing is you're getting, so all of Trove's business is to make you this instance, which is some Linux machine with your underlying guest database and this little piece of software called the guest agent. So when you were to go and say Trove create database, which is the equivalent of the SQL create database command in C, uh, for MySQL, you would be talking to the guest agent, which would talk locally to the guest database, and your database is created for you. This is architecture, not architecture. Okay. So effectively, you have a virtual machine which has an actual database in it, and a little piece of software, which is the guest instance, which is proxying your commands for you. At a high level, that's all you've accomplished with Trove. If you have a bunch of these, put them together and you want to do high availability, your guest agent is going to be involved. We'll talk about that in a second. When you want to spin up one of these instances, there's a certain basic configuration for the database which needs to be created. Um, there's a notion, for example, of where's your database itself going to be? Uh, what volume is it going to be on? There's some configuration parameters which are known. Trove has some default configurations which it sets up. <coughs> um, there are minimum configurations which are required for each database. Um, those are the kinds of things which Trove confines itself to. But other than that, you're absolutely correct. So we made a bunch of instances for these databases. Modular the fact that the tools to build them are pretty painful. At a very high level, all you do is you're creating a VM you're installing a database, you're installing a guest agent on it, and you're putting some scripts which make it when it boots up for the first time to do some one-time stuff. That's about it. Building a net new database is not very hard. It's just a bunch of code relating to how do you actually start it up the first time, where do you get the code, things like that. What's Trove doing besides taking an image at a glance and booting the instance? So there are there is an API that's supported through that Trove CLI where I can do things like create another database, add users, apply configuration changes. So part of what the guest agent's doing is sort of mediating between that generic Trove API to whatever the equivalent commands would be on that particular database. So if I say I want to add a user, uh, that's going to be different on Cassandra or MySQL or whatever. So there is a bit of code that kind of sits between the generic Trove API and the database specific API that you kind of have to add each time you drop it. The agent's the glue, basically. Mm -hmm. It does the dirty work. That's exactly right. So we'll talk about some of the dirty work when we talk about backup and restore, uh, mirroring, replication, clustering, and so on. Because at a high level, what a person wants, like you said, is they want high availability. How you get high availability is very, very different depending on whether you're doing this with MySQL or you're doing this with Cassandra. Okay. I think that the key here, too, is that the Sauce. Like the whole thing with virtualization is that you're just containerizing computers and allowing you to basically spread the resources from one physical machine to many virtual machines. But what you get in that really is literally just HA at your hardware layer only. And that if you want to get it at your application layer, you have to use some sort of agent to reach into, into your actual application to be able to monitor it, heartbeats, things like that. And it needs to know the application specifically in order to do that. And you get that when you use the SD. So the standard MySQL that you download from wherever mm -hmm. has these default configurations. Correct. 
So am I, is that being controlled through the guest agent? My dot CNF is indirectly being controlled through the guest agent. It's actually when you create a new instance, yeah. the default configurations which are set up for your site, either by your provider if you're using a public cloud, or your administrator if you're using a private cloud, is what will be used for you. Okay. And so there's, there's some smarts in there where based on the size of the actual machine you put it on, how correct. much risk you have, how much RAM you have, or whatever, there's a template and then that's modified based on the size of your hardware to come up with a default my.cnf <laughs> what's on the box, and then once it's on the box, you can use the Trove API to say, okay, I want to apply these additional configurations. Additional to match yeah, I, I might like know something more right. about my data. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Got it. Okay. So peeling the onion back a little bit more, this is where it becomes a little bit hairy. A compute instance provisioned for you by Trove <coughs> contains a guest agent and some database, MySQL or NoSQL or what have you. This is controlled by Nova, which got its image from Glance. The image itself is a data store image. We'll tell you where that comes from in a while. Keystone gives you your identity. Intron gives you networking. And everything in this dotted line, the box with the dotted line, is trove stuff, if you will. The stuff outside of that is either your database or other OpenStack components. Your app is nowhere in this picture right now. OK? Can you All right. anything from agent here as well? There's the agent. So that's the portion which we consider to be true. The guest agent is a part of true. There's a different guest agent for each kind of data store. Um, there's a furious debate about whether there should be a MySQL guest agent, a Percona guest agent, and a MariaDB guest agent, or there should be a MySQL guest agent with some tweaks for the other flavor. But let's just say, there's a guest agent for your data store. So there's a guest agent for Cassandra and a guest agent for MongoDB. They're two different things. So the way in which you do stuff with Cassandra is different from the way in which you do it with Mongo. That knowledge is buried in the guest agent. Fine. And you remember along the way I said there was a MySQL database or some SQL-like database. All your configuration crap goes here. This is not your, this is not the database you're trying to spin up. This is your configuration stuff. Okay. Trove API comes along and says, I want to spin up a new instance. Okay. Over, Trove API is going to talk to Nova, spin up a new VM. Once it's done with that, the image it's going to use for that is going to come from Glass. So it's effectively booting the image you want. You get one of these pieces. <coughs> A database is booting up, a guest <coughs> agent is booting up. The Trove API can then talk to the guest agent, push down the configuration which it wants. When all of that happens, all you get is access to your database. You don't get shell access to it. That's one of those wonderful <coughs> things about Trove. Is like RDS, MySQL port 3306, no port 22. Okay? So all you get is a managed database instance. Um, Let's assume later you wanted to go and do a backup. Command for the backup goes to the guest agent. Guest agent interacts with the data store, pushes the backup down to Swift. I could say, oh, by the way, I want to spin up a new instance from a particular backup. Backup from Swift is used, is loaded onto the guest agent. A different VM. Yeah, not a different VM. So you could say, I have, a I have a database, it's running, I take a backup, fine, okay. Next day you come back and say, give me a new instance loaded from this backup. That's how all the various pieces fit together. Effectively, we're not building a new database. All we're doing is we're giving you the functionality to create and use a managed database instance. So, uh, clearly this is the, by far the most common case Trove does not, as best as I know of, support more than one uh, 
guest database per VM. Is that correct, uh, Greg? That's I believe that's the case. Okay. Yes. There's some muttering about that I heard, but the general idea is that image will spin up one database and one database only. You could, of course, do whatever you want because Trove gives you the ability to make your own guest image. You want to put a different kind of guest image on there? I'm sure you could, but I think you would have to probably tweak the guest agent in weird and mysterious ways to make it understand there's two instances. Jay. Well, follow-up question to that. If I, you know, usually sometimes set up multiple databases and have one be a replica of the other and it's, you know, replication queues and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that, are you talking to one guest agent that's managing the entire chain? Or are you, ta are you, or are you talking to one excellent, excellent, excellent question. Right now, right now, true understands the notion of singleton data source. I want MySQL, I get one instance with one MySQL uh, server running on it. I want Cassandra, it's a one node Cassandra cluster. I want Mongo, it's a one node Mongo. One node Mongo. One node Mongo. So no, none of that sharding? Right now, no. Mongo. So, baby steps. Uh, MVP Trove just came out in Ice House. You can spin up a single node version of any data store. Okay. Um, same as the answer to his question, let's talk about high availability in a bit and how you manage all of those things. Okay. So why no shell? Because um, you, you said it's just like RDS, and I get that because <laughs> I'm trusting that RDS engineers are sysadmins for my whatever they're, 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 they're dealing with the SLA. I'm willing to give my money to Amazon RDS because I feel like someone's managing the other side of the house. Like, um, so the, the simple answer is the guest, the guest agent images are set up that way. If you want to set up SSH access on it, nothing prevents it. The, the whole idea is that you're limited to just doing database tasks. Correct. And to limit security as much as possible. It's, you know, it's, being a pass it's a feature, service. not a bug. The yes. idea is you don't have to play around looking at a log file. You don't have to play around with all that stuff. But if you want to get to the bottom of a performance problem, that might be. Yeah, and sometimes you want really to look into the logs. Like, I want to run IOS then. Uh, does that all happen through API instead? The intent in the long term is yes. Currently, the answer is yeah, no, you can't. I, I'll let you know. Uh, you know, the idea is you could develop a service that gives you access to those types of things, or the, the approach we took at HP, something that Brian Aker really wanted to do was make it so that the boxes were completely non-touchable. First of all, the reason for the non whole non-touchable thing is that it's liability to become responsible for people's data if you can access people's data. Originally, we wrote the agent in a way, one of the things I had to do was write the agent so that it would do things kind of in a way where it wasn't even connecting to the database. I wrote a, a UDF an event that would read what I had sent it. So the database would take care of reading what I wanted it to do through the agent, but we changed that. Anyway, that's a whole side thing. But the idea is that you have this thing that if it breaks, you can look at logs with something like um, a logs dash or whatever, something that is built into your system, but that you're not ever accessing that instance. You could, you could in theory, develop the service such that other things are allowed kind of as a service. You build a monitoring as a service that would be able to look at these things. But to actually, yeah, I want to get into this box. The whole idea of pass is to limit that so that. So you're trusting like that the file descriptor limit is set properly? Yep. And I'm not getting. So those are, those are things which are actually settable in your config file and your service provider, if you're in the public cloud, and your site manager, if it's a private cloud, can configure. Okay. Um, trusting the you're trusting the operator of the service at that level. In that particular case, you're trusting the operator of the service. But I'll give you another example. No shell access, var log, mysql, mysql error dot log. I can't get to it. 
in the current way in which Trove is, if there's an error in one of those files, you don't get access to that file. There's a bug fix which is working its way through the process where you can issue an API command which will take the current file, not all the log rotated history, but the current file and dump it out on Swift in a place and tell you where that is. But at this point, if you were to spin up a Trove MySQL instance and shit hit fan, you need shell access to get on that mission. But in the long term, the idea is to, so what did, what did uh, RDS do with that? You can view the error log through a, or the general query log you can view through SQL, you can export the uh, error log uh, to, some, uh, to some S3 bucket. Very same kind of thing. Um, so eventually, the idea of the guest agent is to do things in the dialect of that underlying data store. In theory, you can have a data store for any relational or non-relational database. Right now, there's four with patches for a variety of them, but single instance at this point. No clustering, no replication, and so on and so forth. OK. Before I move on, questions? Would it be possible to take kind of like a snapshot of the EBS and take that and opt in in some different kind of analytics and the logs that way? So it would be a dead image of the running system. I believe you should be able to. Yeah, so, so if you ran through with volume support enabled, shut it down and just look at the volume. No, wait a second. Varlog MySQL is not going to be on there. Uh, Varlog MySQL will be on the boot volume. So yeah, I don't know where you would get that. But in, in theory, the idea is that you could either SSH into it, because at the end of the day, it's what you set up on the guest image. Yeah, yeah. The SSH access is the policy. It's off by default. Right, it's off by default. You can turn it on. And all it is is there's a public key which is sitting in Keystone. Do you want that stuck in the authorized keys file or not? Do you want SSH to be enabled on that? Do you, do you want Neutron to allow port 22 or not? Those three steps will give you shell access to your machine. The default is no. Turn it to yes, and everything works just fine. I think we all run it with yes. Because we're not. We're expect we're we need to get to that for looking at what's going on. Okay. So what's database as a service? Again, quickly, it promises to give you a configured database server on demand, handling all the administrative. That's basically what Shrove is all about. It's not a net new database. It's just an easier to use version of something you already have. Shrove's the OpenStack database as a service project came out in Icehouse, which was a couple of months ago. Initially, it was only going to be RDMS, RDBMSs. Now it's also NoSQL, and you have the full API to everything. OK? All right, this is where we are right now. So where's it headed? So the idea is that all of the things which you're talking about with high availability should be supported. Now, if you only supported relational databases, then all of the terms which people use normally have well-accepted uh, meanings. If you look at a service which supports relational and non-relational databases, replication and clustering are the things which give you high availability. But oh, by the way, replication also gives you performance improvements. So, Rather than trying to go down the path of saying, we're doing clustering for MySQL, and someone saying, then what happens to Mongo and Cassandra? Are you going to do multi-node configurations or not? We went down the path of saying, we're going to do replication in the first phase for MySQL. Then we're going to do multi-instance configurations where clustering, where for MySQL it has one impl implication, for Cassandra it has another implication altogether. But in either case, the way in which we're going to do it is to say, as far as replication goes, at the time when you create your instance, you decide how many replicas you have. Give me a master-slave pair. In the case of clustering, you can say, give me an instance. And later, I can say, 
add one more to the cluster. This is right now being worked on for Cassandra. This is right now being worked on. We're doing this one for MySQL. Neither of them is available right now. The idea is to have this in Juno. I think a bunch of the code has been submitted for review. I haven't seen any code for. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion on this on my part. There was only one patch I saw for backup and restore for Cassandra. I don't think I've seen one for Cluster yet. Um, automated backups, failover and recovery, also to come. Right now, there's manual backups. Hit the button, you can take a backup. You can create an instance from a backup. Automated backups, failover and recovery, not yet done. That's the current state of the project. Whatever the underlying database does, that's it. As far as, so in the case of uh, detection of failure, uh, I don't think we actually, I, mean, I don't think it's even come up as a conversation yet. Uh, whether we're gonna do heartbeat or what we're gonna do, I don't know. So, I don't know if you've been, it's been kind of a learning process for you to participate in an open source project. Uh, <coughs> I've, al I've always been used to a company doing software development on a closed source project. Open source is totally different. Community open source, totally different. Um, so, still coming to groups. Sorry, uh, Patrick, you were going to say. Oh, yeah, plus it's, a commit. it's different than some other open sources. They don't have a benevolent dictator. Or yes, that's they true. They have committees, and with committees, decision making process can be a different. Yeah. This is not the Linus model. Yeah. <laughs> we will do it this way, and over the weekend, we'll change our source control system. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so setting the whole subject of Trove aside for one second, like, like I told you when we started, the idea was that we're going to talk about databases as a service in general. OK, so one other aspect of database as a service is this thing which we've been working on for the last three years or so called uh, database virtualization engine. This is software which we develop. Um, and the basic idea is, if you look at any NoSQL database, horizontal scalability is already built in. Relational databases don't quite have that. Um, so we spent the last three years or so building software which will scale, horizontally scale a MySQL database. Uh, right now, the product we've built works for <coughs> things which look like MySQL. Um, we've tested with Percona, MariaDB, MariaDB version 10, and uh, MySQL are what we've done. I don't think we've announced. Ken, have we announced Maria 10 yet? No. SGA? No, have our support for it and our testing for it. I think we only did 5.5. But it works with anything which looks like MySQL. Um, we provide something which is effectively wire protocol compatible with MySQL. So um, we'll see more about what that looks like in the picture. The software we've built is cloud agnostic. It's in production now on Amazon and Joint, and we're taking the same thing over to OpenStack right now. Um, and we have the ability to do something called adaptive multi-tenancy, which I'll talk about uh, very briefly. But if you're building a SaaS application, Multi-tenancy gives you the ability to scale your MySQL server dramatically compared to what you can do otherwise. Okay. At a very high level, um, this is just a block diagram of the software we've built. The software we've built is the stuff which is in these boxes on the top, not the application. That's your stuff or somebody else's stuff. These yellow boxes are ours. What we've built is software which takes a collection of MySQL servers, these four here on the left, and make effectively a parallel database out of them. Parallel database like you know, uh, a Vertica, an Exadata, that kind of part. A shared nothing parallel database. When your application speaks to our software, your application is under the impression it's talking to a single MySQL server. Your data is, in fact, in this case, partitioned over four servers. And you can issue any query you want, which might attempt to access data from one or more of these nodes at a time. And you can do anything, including a distributed join, an aggregation, uh, what have you. 
where possible, we will execute the query in parallel. If we ever need to share data from multiple nodes in order to execute your query, we make use of these other MySQL servers, which are nothing more than temp tables in the cloud. They're MySQL servers, which are no persistent data. These servers do have persistent data. Does it mean that this is like a cache? Yeah. This is, well, it's not like a cache. It's like temp tables. Um, not so much a cache as it is just okay. intermediate results. But in terms of uh, physical location, is it on the disk or in the memory? Yes, either. For performance, you would, you may want to do something like set these up as machines with, you don't really care about the disk, have a shift out of memory and have a RAM disk. And you can configure these with really fast path to storage and a lot of RAM storage. If you want, if you, if you want the best performance. Okay. So you divide up your data across a collection of these and you're running along just fine. The advantage of this architecture is you can have as many copies of our software as you want, which are fronting some collection of MySQL servers where your data is distributed. And if you have a spike in traffic on your application, <coughs> spin up more of these if you need that. If you need more intermediate servers, spin up more of those. And spin them down when you don't need them. So anytime you're doing a multi-node uh, uh, join, you're setting up new... Uh, uh, There's some collection of them which are sitting there running, uh, and we just provision them, uh, uh, we just use them on the fly. Okay. And if you're spinning up multiple applications, they're gonna, each application can take different queries. Yeah. So what, what if uh, two applications are presented separately presented with queries that overlap data, including updates? Mm -hmm. So where is the consistency coming from? Because it's cross top level application models consistency. At the end of the day, all of these servers are standard MySQL servers. Okay. All that we're doing in these boxes is taking incoming SQL and rewriting it as some other set of SQL. If you have an explicit transaction, we're going to wrap the whole thing in an explicit transaction. Whatever you're doing is transactionally guaranteed to be consistent, because at the end of the day, if you're, let's assume you're using InnoDB as your storage engine or something else which is transactionally aware, not ISAM, the same transaction semantics which your app expects up here will be reflected down here as well. So these separate modern nodes, MySQL nodes, know about each other at that lower level? I thought they don't know anything about each other. The only ones who know about all the nodes are at this level. Each of these nodes, that there's something coming down the wire. It's a start transaction. It's a commit. It's a rollback. It's a two-phase commit. What uh, guarantees the atomicity of it? So if you want, if let's assume you're doing a you're doing a uh, explicit transaction up top. You're going to start an explicit transaction down below. That guarantees your evidence. If you're doing an implicit transaction, we're going to parse the query, and we're going to figure out, let's assume you're doing an update. If you're doing an update, we know how the data is distributed. We know whether we're going to hit a MySQL server or some collection thereof. If it's a server, we'll just send it down as an implicit transaction on that. If it's more than one, we'll do an explicit transaction for that pool. And then will you do a two-phase commit? Or? If required, a two-phase commit, otherwise a directed commit. So if, the consistent, if one application um, is updating multiple sites, mm -hmm. multiple nodes, mm -hmm. then the consistency is maintained by the application box at the top. By, the, by our software, which is running along with the application. Right. But now if you have two application boxes, mm -hmm. they, they don't talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. But these only know that there's a transaction. The thing which is holding the transaction state is down here. There's a connection from here down to the underlying servers. If for any reason the application does something which needs to start a transaction, while the software here knows that the transaction has started, the transaction is really running down here. So each side is being told during each the transaction. Each side is, that's correct. And 
And we have to do some smart things about that. Let's assume that we have a thousand applications up there. I don't want to have a thousand connections to each of these servers. You're going to run out of sockets pretty soon. So if you're not in the middle of an explicit transaction, I'll share a connection, I'll share a socket, so long as credentials match. You'll share a socket between applications? Sure. As long as there's no transaction involved, if it's the same user, I'll do that. And I'll manage your, your context for that. What was the previous command you executed? How many rows did it return? We'll take care of all that for you. But we'll try and minimize the number of connections on your account. If there's, a, if there's a set of credentials which match and so on, if we can cache those connections. On the other hand, if there's an explicit transaction going on, that connection is pinned. Pinned to that particular use case. Okay. So effectively, we spent the last three years building this software. And the last time I was here, I, I didn't have any performance numbers to show you, but this time I do. Um, so this is based on some testing which Percona did for us. Um, all this testing was done in Amazon's cloud. And I have a couple of performance charts, so I'll start with the simplest one. So this particular uh, chart is standard Syspench um, version 1.5, I believe. Or is it 0.5? Uh, 1.5. Tim? What? What's the lower version of Syspench? 1.5 or 0.5? 0 0.5. 0 0.5, thank you. Um, and the test itself is the OLTP <coughs> test, which runs standard database transactions. Each transaction consists of 10 selects, several inserts, an update, a delete, and so on and so forth. And that's one transaction. Um, run from one Amazon instance, which was running Syspench, to an RDS server. We got 33 transactions a second. OK. Um, with a relatively a pretty large volume of data. Um, we took one copy of our software. So what does 1.5 and 3.5 mean? 1.5 means suspend one copy of our software, five MySQL servers. 3.5 is uh, three copies of our software, a load balancer, and suspend above it, and five MySQL servers. One MySQL server, 33 TPS. One copy of Tesoro software and five MySQL servers, 146 TPS. Not quite 5x, pretty damn close. Three copies of our software and five MySQL servers, 222 TPS, which is super scalar at this point. Um, the reason for this is, and, and by the way, these transactions are 14, 15 database operations, several selects, an insert, an update, delete, guaranteeing, a, guaranteeing atomicity for the whole thing. Um, and the reason why we're getting super scalar is because if you take a MySQL server and you have some volume of data and you run some query load through it with Syspench, if you uh, cut the data size to one-fifth and you run the exact same test, you get more than 5x the TPS. We believe it's because of two things, possibly two things. One is the size of indexes are smaller, and potentially because you have one less traversal through the index or one level less of index. Um, the other is maybe caching is better. We're not entirely sure what the reason is, but consistently we're seeing that behavior. So that's the first one. Questions about this before I go to the eye chart? resources when you have more copies of your three machines. This is a total of eight machines running here. But for the middle one, how much more resources? Uh, one, one machine for our software and five machines for my system. Virtual machines. Virtual machines. This is all running on Amazon's cloud. Okay. And this was at 256 threads. So you're running it in the cloud, so you have control, do you know how many physical machines are being given to you? If you launch all of the machines in one launch group on Amazon, the implicit promise is no two VMs shall be on the same physical machine. 
so part of you speed up is to use more hardware. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's more hardware yeah. involved. Yeah, absolutely. But the important thing to realize is, <coughs> if you just take five MySQL servers, yeah, you should get only five times thirty-three, which is one hundred and sixty-five. Except you get two hundred twenty-two. We take care of the organizing for you entirely. That's the point. Okay. And this was a test with 256 threads. Okay, so basically that chart was these three numbers. Persona ran these tests for us. Uh, one thread, two threads, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. Uh, 128 threads, that's the three bars. 64 threads, those are three bars. Basically what I'm trying to get at is, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, a single MySQL server is tapped out at 33 DPS. For a pretty broad range of concurrency in your application, we can get you well over superscalar, well, well over scalar, uh, linear scale. Did you say that you saw a three time of five using eight DMs? Correct. So that's eight. Uh, eight, eight, eight virtual machines, oh, three okay. running us, and five running MySQL. Okay, so you're using eight machines. Correct. Eight, and based on Amazon guarantee. Now. That's you correct. Eight times the hardware of the single device. That's correct. Um, Amazon just guarantees that no two VMs will be on the same box. So you could be running four boxes. Actually, you could be running three boxes. Hmm. Well, if no, if no, if no two VMs are on the same, oh yeah, it's eight. Sorry, six. The third VM has to go someplace different. Yep. Okay. You can't go back. Okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, not very clearly visible here, but. These numbers down here, um, all the way at the left-hand bottom corner, um, a single MySQL server can do on a single thread, 15 TPS, we can do six or seven. Okay. Um, when would you even want to use our software? I can tell you one non-use case. If you have a single connection and you want to drive all your traffic through one single connection, we introduce an overhead. And that overhead is felt here. On the other hand, if you're going to have stuff with many connections, perfect for us. OK. Um, one very common thing which we're told, which I've heard, is um, we have to use a NoSQL database because we cannot ingest data fast enough in SQL. We know we want to query the data later. We know we want to do aggregations. But we got to use a NoSQL database because you can't ingest data fast enough. Okay. A MySQL server ingesting telco CDR records, best I could do 160,000 and change rows per second. 15 of them, a million rows a second. Our goal was to demonstrate to somebody we could do a million a second, we did. This, by the way, is in Amazon's cloud with standard volumes, not, not IO provision volumes and all of that stuff. What is that? Guaranteed. A guaranteed IOP, high IOP, none of that stuff. Standard, um, standard volumes. Uh, and the servers were all M1 large, <coughs> no fancy servers involved. So um, since we're a parallel, since we have since we're a parallel database and we have a large number of servers under the covers, we can in fact ingest data at pretty good click. Um, by the way, when you're doing a million rows a second, the the bottleneck is the network, not us. Is what? The network. Um, okay. Yeah. And I did say that there's an overhead which we introduce into uh, executing queries. Um, we just did a bunch of testing to try and find out exactly what's that overhead. And we ran some very simple queries over a single MySQL server. And those queries took 4 milliseconds, 4.08 milliseconds, give or take change. We did the same kinds of queries, which involved two MySQL servers, 
because we had a persistent site and a dynamic site. The exact same query took 4.7 milliseconds. The overhead which we had introduced was one extra network hop. And a network hop on Amazon at that point in time, including that network hop, it was 0.64 milliseconds. Um, I think a year ago, the same slide talked about an overhead of 1.3 milliseconds. Now we're down to 0.6 milliseconds. That's the last time we've measured it. That's basically the overhead on a single query, not a single transaction, on a single query. And what does that involve? We rewrite your query, we parse it, we take it apart, we add an extra network hop, all of that stuff, 0.64 milliseconds. That's our cost. What that means is if you're trying to do high frequency trading, go look somewhere else. Because that 0.64 milliseconds will mean you'll be out of business. Okay? Um, and somebody we know how, knows how to use R, so we had to do this picture. Um, this entire test was run in Amazon's cloud. And one of the things which, if you ever run a benchmark, you hate about the cloud is the fact that the results you get are ridiculously variable. So uh, this was the same suspense test with various different thread counts with one MySQL, one copy of Tesora 3 MySQLs, one copy of Tesora 5 MySQLs, three Tesora 3 MySQLs, three Tesora 5 MySQLs. Those were the test configurations here. <coughs> this is the response time. Higher is not better. Yet, since this is the cloud, fewer threads, pretty nicely long. Large numbers of threads, your response time is this bell curve here. Anywhere from, I don't know, 7,500 milliseconds to 15,000, seven and a half seconds to 15 seconds. We reduce the response time, but we can't do anything about the variability. Okay? Is that nice, cool picture? The previous caption for this slide was this is like a DNA match in every NCIS. 98.6% guys are killer. Yeah, this is exactly what they show you. Just change the captions. <laughs> how, long, how long do you acquire the data? How long did you? How long is the test? Right. Oh, so each test is one hour. One hour. One hour for the test. Yeah, my credit card really loved these tests. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you imagine how many iterations we had to run to get you know, reasonably narrow tolerances on these things? Yeah. So you're running Sysbench for an hour, and that's the smear you get. Yeah, Amazon is known for uh, unstable yes. connectivity. Is they, even they know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why did, why did we talk about all this stuff? So we talked about two very different things. One was all about OpenStack, and one was about us. So this whole thing was a setup for the following six or so slides. So in the OpenStack cloud, what we're selling is a database as a service with both Trove and VVE. You can go get Trove from OpenStack. Yes, absolutely. But you can't scale your MySQL with it. You can't horizontally scale your MySQL. All you can do is vertically scale it. We give you a combination of both. Horizontally scale your MySQL database with us. The MySQL database itself is provided by Trove. We provide the horizontal scale. And of course, your NoSQL databases are, OK, this is wrong. We should fix that. We don't provision NoSQL databases. All right. The Trove is, Trove is the one provisioning the NoSQL databases. Trove is going to be doing horizontal scalability with clustering and all that stuff sometime soon. And the whole thing is orchestrated with heat. One common console, a fully elastic database as a service, relational and non-relational, in the OpenStack cloud. OK, what does it look like? All of the underlying features which come with OpenStack, Trove, and 
MySQL scale out in multi tenancy, which we're going to add. And then all of the other things which are plugins on OpenStack. Now, not all of these are available with <coughs> OpenStack. We will give you all of these as part of our plan. That's basically what we're selling. Okay. And in the OpenStack environment, these instances are all no instances. They run our software, they run the application, what have you. These are all Trove instances under the covers. Networking is from Neutron, the storage is from Cinder. That's the OpenStack way of doing all of this stuff. Okay. Assume you were to do the same exact thing in Amazon's cloud. RDS provides you with MySQL. EC2 provides you with NoSQL. DynamoDB is going to give you the NoSQL part of it for horizontal scale. But we will give you uh, DBE, which will scale your database, or your relational databases horizontally. OK? And we have somebody who runs this in production where this entire tier is Elastic Beanstalk. We make an image of this thing. And we give Beanstalk the criteria one, two, and nodes. This is a collection of RDS servers. When their application gets a lot of load, Beanstalk automatically spins up more of those. When they get a lot more data over time, they just add more servers here. They get almost constant response times. Okay. And all this was a setup for something which we're working with a, a large telco on, which is a data as a service platform, a data as a service platform. These guys have got petabytes of data, which is very, very hard for them to keep queryable at all time. So what we've done for them is we've put all their data, or we're working with them on this, we haven't yet done it. All the data will sit on some inexpensive Swift databases. And continuously, they keep refreshing this with new data sets as they come along. And a really valuable thing which we have to maintain is a catalog. What data sets do you have? What years is this data available for? What months? What granularity? Who has access to it? Not everybody has access to it. But an analyst comes along and says, I want data for the following six zip codes for this particular data set. And he goes and hits a button. And right now, if he wants to get that data, it takes him six months to get a database with that data. Somebody has to go and get IT to provision a database, and somebody's got to go load it, somebody's got to go get the tape, all this happy horseshit. Um, in their OpenStack infrastructure, we demonstrated to them that they could spin up a new database provisioned for an end user in seven minutes. Pick up the data, hydrate it, load it, Within a half day, we should have a pretty good sized data store for him to go and query. And the value of this is if you have to wait six months to get a database which you can query, you probably are going to ask, you're probably going to think really hard before you say, well, I want to get data for another zip code. If you can change that to, I get this in, in a half a day, the guy's perfectly happy to go say, I ran three queries, confirmed my hypothesis, here's my next hypothesis, give me another one. Which fundamentally makes this data a whole lot more valuable. So the value here is not, yeah, we built this parallel database with you know, funny colors and all this happy stuff, but it changes the way in which your analyst is able to think about it, and it changes the value of this data. All because OpenStack can give you a thing called Trove, which can provision you instances really quickly, and we can put some NOAA instances on top of it, which make it easy for you to query all the standard relational databases. What is their criteria for what type of their data source? How are they organized? So they're, they're getting data from a whole bunch of places, point of sale devices, marketing campaigns, people clicking on their website, they're tracking who's um, clicking their website, cookies, all this kind of stuff. And they're gathering information about every interaction they have with a customer or a person. The typical use case for this is somebody wanting to validate, if I ran a marketing promotion in this particular area, what do I expect the pickup to be? Um, the data they want to store in a self-describing format, um, they wanted to use something called Avro, 
Apache Avro. I had never heard of it until we started working with them on this. Um, so we needed to write a loader for Avro, which is, it's basically a... Um, well, that's the application at the top, okay. No, that's not the application. Oh. The data here is stored in Avro. Oh, Avro, uh, okay. Avro so. is some kind of self-describing format where um, it stores metadata and data together, and over time, therefore, if your table is changing, the metadata is embedded with a table, and you don't have the situation which says, table now has 421 columns, but six years ago it had you know 300 columns. I can't load this shit in that table. It's analogous to some kind of a FRM type. Something, yeah. yeah. Data They're share. looking at it as master data management never delivered this stuff for us. We are therefore burying the schema into the table. So something on those lines. Uh, which of course means there's some points of discontinuity where you can't say spanning this point of discontinuity load data from before and after. That's fine. That's still okay. So that's a use case of something which we're trying to do. Horizontal scalability from us, Stroke providing all these databases, cheap storage with Swift, cost layer storage with Cinder, Provision, use it, throw it away, start again. That kind of stuff. So summary. Oh, I forgot. Breaking news. Um, so all. Of, so by the way, OpenStack is all open source. You can go download the stuff. Um, it's a whole bunch of Python scripts. Kind of sort of. You get to use it. Um, all of our stuff till till tomorrow was closed source. Um, we're making the entire thing available open source three ways. You can get the source code <coughs> there, and you can build your own. Um, you can get the binaries of the core, <coughs> and I have a picture of what's going to be open source and what's not. Everything in green is going to be open source. The one little thing up there, which is in red, is going to be part of the enterprise edition. Um, and if you go to the enterprise edition, you're going to get professional support. Uh, you're going to get UI, and you're going to get installers for um, basically the, the channels for you to configure your aptitude, Debian, and RPM. Um, with community, you can either build your own or you can get a tarball and you can install it and use it. This is fully functional. This is not um, hobbled in any way. We've not taken out any functionality. Every goddamn thing which is in the Enterprise Edition other than the UI is available here. Um, you can insert, update, delete. You can have a cluster as big as you want, everything you want to do. Okay. Um, talked about that. Where do you get a copy? Um, there. And you can also get all of our OpenStack bundling. Um, if you were to go to OpenStack and try and download Trove, uh, or you were to install all the OpenStack bits from Ubuntu on your machine, and you then wanted to install Trove, it's a nightmare. So we've taken all of Trove, packaged it up as installers. Um, simple steps for you to install, they're all here. Um, this is configuring your APT repository. Uh, APT get install. Um, these are the components for your controller. These are the controllers for your guest instance, or this is the code for your guest instance. Um, we also give you guest images for various flavors of databases, uh, MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, and Redis. Um, standard 2 cow 2 images, download them, push them into Glance, you're all set and run. Everything now available. Community ID. Uh, I think it's quite commendable that you're making it open source. Mm -hmm. um, just could you say a few words about the, uh, your motivation for making it open source, and including something about how you were able to support the development but and still make it open source? Um, okay, so how did, why did we do open source? Um, I mean, I think it's a great thing. I'm just trying to, so to, to understand open source a little more to motivate others to be similar. So the, uh, the reason why we didn't do open source up front was, we're, so talk about just DB. Leave, leave OpenStack aside entirely, okay? Okay. If you wanted to take our software a year and a half ago, two years ago, and try and do something with it yourself, it would be probably less likely that you would be successful than today. Right now, the product has come to a point where I'm relatively con confident 
that I can point, say to a person, here's where you go download the stuff uh, over, say, there. Mm -hmm. Download it. There's a readme. It tells you what you need to do. There's some tools which tell you how to distribute your data. They can analyze your queries. They can do all that stuff for you. You'll be able to get up and running with a higher level of confidence than I could have said two years ago. Um, the second is, we've learned over the last three years that people these days are more comfortable trying and using software if they can download it and use it on their own terms. There was a time when I thought open source meant people were cheap and didn't want to pay for shit. Um, people want to be able to try it out without getting a sales guy on the phone, without having a high pressure sales call. And some percentage of them are comfortable paying for it afterwards. I don't believe that by making it open source, we're going to make less money because more people are going to use it for free. I believe we'll make more money because more people will try it out and some percentage will be willing to pay for it. You have two choices, right? 100% yep. of zero is still less than 0.1% of a shitload large number. That's what MySQL proved. That's basically where this is. Um, OpenStack is a open source community. Are we saying everything we're doing is open source? No. Enterprise edition. Pay for support. Pay for some features which are not in the community edition. In, um, in Expertise. Expertise. Uh, if even on our OpenStack version, um, if you want to run OpenStack in production and you want to run Trove in production, there is a very, very, very good chance that you will find that the open source version of the guest agent is not good enough for you. How do I know that? Rackspace and HP both figured that out. Now, do you want to go implement your own guest agent in programming lang language of your choice, or would you be willing to pay somebody to get one of those? So your enterprise edition doesn't provide a better user agent, but enables you to provide the expertise to tell a user agent. It'll provide you. It'll provide you with a supported open source version of the guest agent. If, si yeah, similar to similar to what every other open source. If you hit a problem with it. We'll be the guys who go get it fixed for you, drive it into the community, make sure the patch is accepted, and the patch comes back downstream. However, we will also offer you other things which may not be in the open source version at all. That's the motivation. It's, just, it's the exact same model which a lot of other people have used, but other people have tried other things. There's a database company which said our open source version will select. You can't in, you select an insert. You can't delete or update. Well, we know who that is, but okay. No, we're not that one. With our community edition, you can do everything which you can do with the enterprise edition, except we don't give you a web UI. The enterprise edition comes with 30-day free trial license. Go to our website. You don't have to give us your email address if you want the community <coughs> edition. We'll give you a URL, download it, knock yourself out. If you want our enterprise edition, you don't have to give us your email address. You could give us your email address if you want to. You can use the enterprise edition for 30 days with no questions asked. Fully functional. Okay. Sign up for short stack. It's really good. It's low calorie, I guarantee. Tweet about the fact that we're open source. Go. I already did that. You already did. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This is fun.